Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live talk with Megan DeBayer. My name is Danielle and I'm a Program Development Officer with Gold Coast Libraries. Megan is an expert in conscious parenting, holding degrees in psychology and holistic ecology. Megan's work has, has helped thousands of parents across the globe navigate the tricky waters of parenting in adolescence. On Megan's website, you will find her popular course, Strong Mothers, Strong Sons, as well as other courses and information to help parents develop essential tools to build positive relationships with their children. So one of Megan's great passions is helping mothers thrive on the parenting journey. And it's this passion that inspired Megan's best-selling book, How to Raise a Man, A Modern Mother's Guide. And tonight she's going to share her advice on how to raise our sons to become good men. So welcome, Megan. Hello, thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to sharing um, this vital information about raising teenage boys. Before I even begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am not saying it's up to a mother to raise a teenage boy into his adulthood. This book was written simply because I believe that mothers have particular questions about boys. We did not grow with testosterone through our, uh, rushing through our bodies as teenagers. We grew as females with our estrogen and progesterone impacting on our brains and our emotions the way it does. And um, so I wrote this guide not suggesting that there is a massive difference between mothers raising boys or mothers raising girls, but that I was a single parent raising two boys. And I found it quite a confusing time. And when I spoke to, when I was, my boys were still at school in, in senior school, I spoke to other mothers, they expressed the same thing. They said, look, I don't know where my precious, gorgeous little boy has gone. I know he used to say, mommy, 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 I love you. I want to marry you. Please look at this. And now he's pushing me away. He's closing the bedroom door. He's having those long showers. I don't know what's going on. He's quite rude. He sometimes doesn't even want me to go to the sports field or uh, his friend's opinions are, are far more important than mine. Meanwhile, I'm still having beautiful long conversations with my daughter, but every time I speak to my son, he's saying, mom, stop being a rash. Yeah, just, I'm fine, chill, you know? And, and sometimes I know my son said to me, mom, just get a life. So I felt that um, there were things I, I needed to understand. Mothering a teenager is, a, is an anxious time. And we see ourselves as, the, as parents and as guardians of their, their hearts, their spirits, their emotions. We want to teach them life skills. We want to help them to cope. The idea and intention for parenting should always be to equip them with the skills, the values, the ethics, the, the, the belief in self that they can go out into the world as an adult and in this case talking about boys move towards becoming a fine young man so the first thing I want to remind you is that as a parent we need to look at what is it that we can control what is it that we can't and what do we really need to let go of that it's not our business and that kind of was a central theme of my book because I looked at, especially during the pandemic, when I was finishing up this book last year for Australia, looked at the fact that we could not control the circumstances that were going on. We couldn't control that. Now we were homeschooling some of us. A lot of things began to um, be directed online. Our homes became kind of sometimes prisons, but but we were hoping our homes to become sanctuaries and safe havens during a time of kind of global anxiety and worry. And so there were things we could not control, the circumstances. But what I decided and saw is that we can control ourselves. So we can bring conscious reflection and tools 
as parents to uh, manage our own attitude and our own actions and our own quality of presence in our homes and in our parenting. So I focused a lot on conscious parenting, which means looking to yourself for the wisdom and answers that you need to bring forward. So parenting from the inside out and that conscious parenting required us to be more self-aware, much more intentional, get to grips with our own values and understand what was worth fighting about. And what was worth fighting about was the values and the life skills that we wanted to, to teach, to share, to coach. We also needed to look at ourselves and, and look at our own developmental stages as an adult woman, possibly perimenopausal or menopausal. And we needed to look at how we were being impacted by our own development, where we were in life and our philosophy decided on a really clear intention about what our own purpose is, because there's no doubt that as a mother of a teenager, um, if he is pushing us away, we need to come back to our own life and look at what are our own dreams? What are our purposes? What sort of person do we want to be in the world? How can we lead by example? in the life that we lead. So we need to come back to that in our own development, but we also need to understand teenage development. Where are they at? What are they grappling with? What is maturity? How can we encourage a boy towards his maturity? How can we um, help him develop an emotional EQ? And how can we as a mother of a boy not shame a boy for his boisterousness or his sudden surge of hypermasculinity because I, I do find during the teenage years that the early teenagers especially around 13 14 15 there's a real need for who am I what are my strengths how do I fit in am I popular and a, a deep self-consciousness arises so we often see our teenage boys as being selfish ungrateful not appreciative you know and we can go on about that because he seems to only have enthusiasm for what he wants and I need to remind you that that is evolutionarily narrowly appropriate this boy has a natural impulse towards discovering himself in the world he has a natural impulse impulse to discovering his place amongst his friends. So his drive is, is outward. And so his enthusiasm and motivation is are for the things that stimulate him. And of course, there's brain science as well that's going on. Um, yesterday, I spoke to Dr. Sarah McKay, an Australian um, uh, doctor who specializes in neuroscience. And um, she said the most fascinating thing which is, is that as this teenage brain is developing and myelination is taking place, and I talk about this in the book, which means the brain is being pruned, um, we can see brain fog in teenagers. So a, an organized boy is suddenly disorganized. And she explained that although testosterone is surging through the body and, and increasing his muscle density, uh, causing particular smells coming up, especially if your boy is around 15, 16, and because of that high testosterone. And, and, but estrogen is playing a part in rewiring that brain. So as it's thinning out and the prefrontal cortex is lighting up in a, a, a more obvious way, around the age of 16. So there might be a bit of brain fog happening 12, 13, 14. It, it's the prefrontal cortex, which is about um, thinking of consequences, um, holding back on impulses, setting intentions. It really only comes on board during the mid to later teenagers. So those of you who have got young teenagers, yes, you're going to be nagging and reminding him of consequences of his actions and helping him to control his impulse. Because after all, we want our boy to go out there in the world and, and make good choices. So that's part of our parenting job. So 
yes, I think that what's important is that we've got to recognize that a teenage boy's relationship to you as his parents is vital. And to me, there is no doubt that during the early teenage years, the mother um, plays a vital role in the drama that unfolds in, in a boy's life as he's trying to discover his assertiveness. He's still, as a, as, a, as a little boy, he's still very attached to you and he'll be very home-centered. But as that sort of testosterone hits around 12, 13, he's wanting to spread his wings, yet he has not let go of you yet. And I loved this poem that went viral. It was a quote from a teenager. I desperately need you, mom, to hold the other end of the rope while I thrash on the other side trying to find new footholds. I used to know me, you, us, the world. Now I don't. I need to pull on you. And I thought it was just such an incredible quote because it speaks to um, this lostness that does occur in a boy as he's trying to assert himself in toward, towards his maturity and his adult. And he does not want to hold on to mom tightly because it can be seen as um, him being dependent on mom, which is, is not a cool thing to do during the early teenage years. And there are these messages from society no matter where you act on the gender spectrum and, and uh, whether you feel strongly that you're not differentiating between your boy and your girl in the home, there are still these messages in society that are encouraging a boy to be big, strong, bold, to be the leader, to be the one that um, you know, conquers his emotions and that it can, can get out there and show strength. So there's still those messages coming through his gaming, through social media, through magazines like Men's Health. And, this, and it seems to impact the early teenage years. So this hyper-masculinity that, that comes on board, it can be very frustrating for us as mothers. And it's important that we don't shame him in this in the throes of his discovering his this this new aliveness and this boisterous male aliveness that might be showing up in the early teenage years does not mean that your boy is on his path to becoming a chauvinist. And so all of this stuff that's going on means that an empowered mother, sure of her values, conscious of who she is in the world and what her purpose is and what her role is and being clear about your parenting principles, that I want to stand on the values that I believe in, that I want a home to be a place of, of, of sanctuary, a, a safe place where my boy can be whoever he wants to be. He might not be able to do whatever he wants to do, but he can be. And we show up giving our kids a quality of attention that they really need. Because after all, no matter how much um, a, a boy seems to want his independence and autonomy, he still needs your attention, your approval, um, and your good advice. And so we've got to discover that in ourselves. So his shutdown that can happen in different ways it can happen because of a closed door or it can happen because he literally says leave me alone or it can happen because he withdraws and just goes silent those shutdowns can make you feel angry it can break your heart you can feel like you have lost him and it's important to recognize that that is not true the unconditional love of a mother is vital for a boy and the unconditional love of a mother will help a boy remember his heart, remember his home, remember his values. So I'm going to say one thing now that I think is vital for all of you to remember. Your son may wander off from home and wander off from you and appear to be almost rejecting you, which can cause tremendous heartache. But he needs you to hold on to that rope. He needs to feel that there is someone on the other end so that it can give him 
that security. And the more you focus on building relationship with the basic tools of relationship and what are those basic tools? And I talk about it in the book. Sorry, I'm referring to it because I'm holding the book right here. Um, those basic tools of understanding, listening, um, empathy, seeing things from his perspective, understanding the teenage development uh, phase. So not just looking to yourself to kind of control and dominate and get your point across, but making room for his own voice, no matter how silly you feel it is. So all those principles that you are, are putting in, in place uh, is going to build relationship. And it's the relationship that is going to keep your son safe. And it doesn't have to be a relationship to you as mom. It can be a relationship to dad. And this book, really, honestly, I've heard from so many people that it's, it's a book dads can read too, to understand the relationship of mother and son, but also to understand dad's role in, in a son's life. And so a lot of the principles and the exercises, it's quite a practical book. So at the end of each chapter, I have exercises will help you engage with um, these things that um, are vital for parenting so that as he's holding on to that rope and you on the other end, you are remaining in relationship with him no matter how far he's wandering off because it's his good valued relationship to you as parents that is going to inoculate him from the vices and we all know the vices okay so we're all aware and worried about those teenage vices and and it belongs to his social work so it's social world so it's increased social media and i talk about that in the book you know worrying about substance abuse about drugs about vaping about um alcohol underage drinking we worry about pornography, we worry about sex, and that's all out there in the social world, which is where he's going now. So if we could keep him at home, lock the door and throw away the key, that would be yeah, calm us down and calm our anxiety down, but it won't help him to grow into his maturity. So we've got to trust him, trust our parenting, trust life. And, Rick, and how do you trust life? I think the the beautiful thing for me is recognizing the soul level and I believe completely and utterly that we are all on a soul journey discovering our destiny our place in this beautiful ecology in this universal intelligence so if you remember that there is a soul journey and he has to live that life and he's reaching for his life and his destiny and his purpose and he's trying to discover it in all these explorations he's doing that we call the vices um, but do we still have to put in boundaries yes yes and yes again so a good relationship will always include boundaries um, there's that beautiful thing that uh, Brené Brown says about every good relationship should have braving in it so that's a braving as in b-r-a-v-i-n-g and it stands for boundaries first reliability accountability vaults vault being how do we keep the secrets of um, our sons safe because he shared them with us and i'm speaking to moms and dads here how do we hold that as precious even though sometimes some of the things he tells us we find outlandish you know or, or silly it's they're precious to him. How do we hold that? And then the R is integrity. Um, the N is non-judgment and then G for generosity. So, I mean, those are the basics that you would build any good relationship on. And I always include ourselves in that. So we've got to look at what we are bringing. So in the beginning of the book, I talk about what sort of mom are you? Are you a controlling mom, a fix-it mom, a happy, you know, trying to promote happiness in your home? Are you, what sort of mom are you? And I do some exercise and looking at that. I also look at that it's important for us to reparent ourselves. So if you want to raise somebody properly, raise yourself first. So looking at reparenting yourself and I ask questions about, you know, what was your relationship with, like with your mom? And, and ask your your 
partner, your husband, what was your relationship like with your mom? And, and begin to reflect on that, to recognize that um, soon our, our boys will grow and therefore they'll look, at, at, look back at us and we want that good, warm, open relationship. And as a mother of older boys, it is so satisfying to have a good, open, mature relationship with my sons, incredibly satisfying. And I'm pleased that I dedicated my time to building relationship as opposed to just losing it over a pair of socks or, or a wet towel and finding ways to recognize when I was off track and coming back and apologizing. So keep on, I kept on building relationships. So what else I talk about in the book is a lot on conscious parenting. I talk about crippling parenting mistakes that you might be making, especially around overparenting, um, not recognizing the need for your boy to explore the world. I've, I, I do talk about masculinity and about this, you know, protect the bro code and, and what that's about and that it is, it does um, kind of, um, yeah, really engage your boy for a period of time. And then I also, um, as I said, I've got that last chapter. Oh, I talk about sex and, 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 and social media. I talk about alcohol in the book. So all of that stuff is there and I give tips and the tips are always coming back to what is conscious parenting and what is a meaningful life. Um, so Hayley has asked, how do you move on from constant white lies over sneaking electronic devices um, in a 13-year-old? So obviously I don't need to tell our listeners that part of being a teenager is pushing the boundaries so teenagers are always going to push the boundaries they're also going to forget the consequences of their actions and that's going to carry on till they're at least in their later 16th year so in those early teenagers honestly it's i can't say it's a half formed brain but it's a forming brain so therefore, this brain is in the, in the flux of change. And teenagers do forget. You've told them 10 times and they'll, they'll, they'll still want to try it their way. Don't forget this need for him to assert himself, especially against the mother, because the mother is the soft touch. So we've got to find it in ourselves to so hold a little smile on the inside and recognize this little bull behavior forever trying to assert itself, show itself, be mature, be big, be bold, be brave. And, and that's coming through quite a lot in the 12, 13, 14. So if you can hold that little smile on the inside, but still go back and put in that boundary. And, and we as moms and dads are going to find ourselves putting in those boundaries over and over and over again. So my advice to this mom is, yes, you still got to hold the line. You still got to put in the boundary. Don't shame him for the white lies. Just go straight in and say, look, I know you're using the device. So, you know, you can tell whatever story you want. So we don't need to shame him for that, but we still got to put in the boundary. And then if it continues, then you've got to say what the consequences are going to be and then stick to it. So when you say, I'm taking the device away, um, don't go overboard and say for a whole month or a whole year, um, put something in place that's realistic, recognizing that our teenagers, especially during the pandemic, need to be connected to their friends, but they can't be on devices all the time. So we've got to find this balance now between devices being used to connect to their work and to their friends, to their social life, but the safety boundaries because devices all the time are not good for the brain. They're not good for concentration. They're not good for emotional health. So as the, the protector of your son's emotional and mental health, we have got to put that boundary in and, and he's not going to like you for it. So that's the big, big, big thing for all of us is to recognize that as we put boundaries in, we're not going to be liked. And so if you are that pleasing mom and that mom that wants to please, you've got to pull yourself up and recognize, no, you've got to parent from your principles and from your values and not whether you liked or loved. And I promise you, in the end, you'll respect and come back around to you. I, I know that. 
What else is? Are there Thank any other questions one. coming through? Yes. Yeah, so there's another one that says, um, "How to choose? How to? How do you choose the best school for your child? I mean, what should I look for in a school and in my child to make the right decision? A Catholic school, which is play-based learning, or a Steiner school with lots of freedom?" Mm -hmm. So it's important that a school fits our families. It's no use being in an alternative school when mom and dad or, 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 or mom and your partner um, are alternative. So the values of the school must fit the family. That is the, the most important thing. Then the next step is to look at your son and to look at what are his inclinations? What are his talents? And clearly, if a boy is more creative and, and has this tendency to want to be engaged with, with art, with expression, with drama, then a Steiner school and a Montessori school can really help that. The more conservative schools um, and the more traditional schools and the all boys schools are great for boys who are showing up with lots of testosterone and adore sports. And I think we need to stop worrying about if he goes an alternative route, doesn't mean he's not going to fit in, doesn't mean he's not going to get into university. That's, that's old fashioned thinking. The thinking is, does the school fit with the personality type, the interests, the talents, and the values of the home? Well, yes, we know that nature has been good for us and we know that nature uh, calms us and helps us with anxiety, but how can you apply nature to parenting? And so some of the principles of nature are that everything in nature is always in relationship. Everything's in relationship. And those relationships are dynamic and changing at all times. So even if you had to witness a plant in the back of your garden, you know, or, or on one of your walks, um, you will see how trees and plants and vines are always moving um, in quite a dynamic way, making room for each other, but also looking for the light. So, and it's dynamic and it can change at all times. So in are we making room for that in our own home? That relationships are, are terribly interconnected. Your son is being influenced by his school, by his friends, by your relationship with your partner, by his grandparents, um, by his culture. So there are many interlinking relationships that are affecting where your son is and trying to isolate a problem or isolate a problem child is not an easy thing to do it's much more complex there are many things and if you if you look at the family as an ecosystem you can't say my daughter has an eating disorder or my son is beginning to cut or my son is the problem because he's got an addictive personality or he's got attention deficit and, and that's the problem and focus on the problem. You've got to step back and have a wider perspective and see that the, the family operates as an ecosystem and, and there are many complexities. So we've got to bring ourselves into it and see what we bring into the party and what your relationship is bringing to the party and how that's showing up then in, in your son. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say about that. The, the second is um, this thing called emergence. So in nature, there's a lot of emergence where things come together and a third thing emerges out of it. So whether it's, um, you know, you cut down a tree, the, 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 the bark falls on the ground and up springs lachen, fungi, new plant growth, or even a new shoot. So it's a natural emergence and you can't focus on the outcome. So it's a huge lesson for us, that idea of emergence, because what we can get from that is in a family, stop focusing on outcome, purpose, where you're trying to get to and come back to quality of relationships, bring yourself present. Um, when the same problem focus, pops up again, bring yourself present. What could be different? 
what could be the opportunity in this circumstances? What can we learn? And that is something you should be saying to your son a lot. What did you learn from the circumstance? What would you do differently next time? Um, and stop focusing on the outcome and the reward of the outcome and focus more on the effort and the trying and the process and the journey. So I just wanted to raise that and sort of try and inspire you to, in, when you buy the book, to really read that last chapter. There's a lot of deep wisdom in there that is not my wisdom. It comes from me delving into understanding uh, nature's principles. Are there any other questions that have come up in the meantime? Oh, there's just one more here. Can you talk more about how the relationship with the partner can affect the child? For example, if the parents are not getting along. Okay, great one. So most parents worry about um, different parenting approaches and stop worrying about that. Unless a partner is abusive. And abusive behavior is, is violent, undermining, belittling, shouting, uh, hopefully not slapping, hitting, but abusive behavior. Obviously, if you're the partner of an abusive person, it's really important that you get help and put in boundaries. You cannot just leave it. That abusive behavior is going to cause trauma and, and affect a child in the long run. But if it's just normal parenting differences, like the one parent is more lenient and the other parent is more strict, that is fine. You are preparing your children to go out there into the world. So they have to experience different attitudes, different approaches, different ways that we communicate, different, different feeling styles, different em emotional states, your son needs to be prepared for that in the world. So it's more about, well, dad does it this way, or, or, or mom does it that way, and I prefer it this way. Um, and your child will find his way through that. So I'm not, I'm not bothered about different parenting styles. What I am worried about is how those parents are talking and resolving conflict. The most important thing is how are parents communicating and resolving conflict? Are you being a good example of resolving conflict in your home? Or are you just lambasting and, 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 you know, or belittling each other? Because obviously that is going to be copied. I also think that um, the differences in masculinity and femininity and differences between the masculine archetype and the feminine archetype is really important in the home. We're wanting our boys to uh, remain in contact with his, his dreams, his soul, his emotions, and grow into the world as a, a human being that understands this balance between the feminine and the masculine. And therefore, there's a strong role for both the masculine and the feminine in guiding a boy towards living a balanced life. So I think that if there is, uh, if there is belittling of the feminine in the home, in the feminine way um, and, and emotions, that, that wouldn't be a good thing, not in our climate right now. We'd need to understand that there's a place for the feminine archetype and there's a place for the masculine archetype and those both need to be celebrated in our homes. Thank you, Megan. Um, another question here is how can teachers improve engagement of teenagers as boys often disengage from learning and reading in high mm. school mm. Right. so especially young teenagers and middle teenagers when boys are in an all boys school it, um, i have found over and over that boys ganging together seems to have an impact on their own testosterone so boys Together in a group, you, you will see an increased level of activity, testosterone, um, sparring, gaming. And as boys gang together, they can be quite anti 
lessons, authority, direction, being told what to do. And therefore, a, a teacher needs to be pretty boundary themselves and put very, very clear rules and guidelines in place and, and stick to them. Now, the difficulty with that is that boys' attention spans can be quite short, especially if we are expecting them just to read, write, sit down and listen. So we've got to engage boys in activities, in, in games, in visuals, in opportunities to try things out. And that, wow, it's so tough for a teacher because a teacher needs to come up with ways to teach through physical engagement. So sometimes it's kind of physical games. Um, but then there is a time to, for boys just to sit down quietly and get on with their work. But those attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter. So I have found attention deficit higher amongst boys than amongst girls. So their attention span seems to be quite tight. So I think all teachers need to remember that to be give them a period of time where they can settle down and do their lessons and then a period of time for breathing activity and, and some form of sort of uh, gaming to help them understand their lessons. But in saying all of that, I love the mindfulness techniques. So making room for breath work, for uh, reminding boys to kind of take a stretch, to ground, to center, to feel their bodies in the room. And especially when we're doing this online work, I often, even while I'm talking to you now, remember to feel my body on this chair. And you can see I'm quite restless. I am that person. So I have to feel into my body and I've got to feel into my breath and remind myself that I have a, I have a body. And so I use this acronym called SELF, S-E-L-F, SELF. And we've got to remember times for serenity and quietness and doing that through breath through sitting still, through having some relaxation time. E for exercise, and that could just involve stretching, um, could be simple exercise from a walk to aerobics and, and how important that is in, in our day. L for love, so our relationships, our tenderness, our connections are radically important. And then F, food. So a boy is not going to be available for anything if he's hungry and I often find teenage boys in particular more than girls are you know really need a good balanced diet and not too much sugar oh, well I'd prefer no sugar uh, especially for their attention capacities <laughs> no, definitely the sugar is an issue <laughs> for all children um <laughs> another question um this person mother had a strong personality and was quite controlling and it has affected their own personality and self-confidence um, she can tell she's become a mother the same so how can she change that and not to pass on to the next generation so this really is about reparenting of the self and um, it's as a psychologist I've dealt with this a lot and uh, not this particular issue, but recognizing how our parents impact on us. And we need to then find a way to reparent ourselves. And the first step is, sorry for this, but it's such a tough one. We need to forgive. So it's to recognize that our parents, no matter how they were, were probably the results of their own parenting and we're doing the best they probably can. Um, could in the circumstances and and so therefore the first step is forgiveness so is finding relief in that forgiveness towards our own parents then identifying which this person already has done that the impact of that parenting style on themselves and this it how it's shaken their confidence so I do a lot of self work and and, and self-healing around um, self-compassion I'd be parenting myself by giving myself more gentleness more kindness more self-compassion in this particular circumstance with the controlling mom 
I then looked to the opposite. What was lacking? What was lacking for me? And clearly what was lacking was kindness, softness, responsiveness, and spontaneity. So this person probably has really had their free child, their spontaneous child, the golden child within themselves crushed. And so there's a need for this person to go back in and discover within themselves that child that needs to be spontaneous. And I'd encourage some fun, spontaneous acts. Um, when I worked on my own spontaneity and my own reparenting of my own free child, I remember sitting working and I was so controlling of myself I had to you know get the grades achieve um, so I took that external controlling mother and I became the controlling critic of myself and I had to recognize that first soften and I remember sitting the one day and thinking why am I inside here just working making sure I'm you know getting everything right and I looked outside and the sun was shining and there was beautiful dappled sunlight on my lawn outside and I just picked up my chair and I took it onto the lawn and that was one of my first spontaneous acts of kindness towards myself so spontaneous acts of kindness towards yourself to soften the sternness that you bring towards yourself and the moment you begin to do that you'll find you will do that with your children so the the softer and kinder and more compassionate and gentle you become towards yourself it will naturally unfold so that your attention towards your children become more is more heartfelt and um, another exercise to try is to keep holding the image of wherever your son or daughter is, whatever age they are, keep holding an image of them as a little one. So of three or four and hold that image and let that image soften your heart. And when it softens your heart, then step in to your teenager with this kind of softer, more open heart. It doesn't mean he gets away with anything. Remember, your son can be whoever he wants to be. He can't do whatever he wants to do so there is always this activity between boundaries and uh, compassion and empathy and openness and allowing but you can't just with the teenagers let go of those boundaries but we've got to do the dance the whole time between when are we going to put in those boundaries and be tough and 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 in these words, kind of fairly controlling because we've got to put an instruction in place. And when are we going to make time for um, empathy, emotional support, heartfelt engagement, spontaneity, fun, 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 fun. I'd highly recommend fun for this mom trying to find the fun and things. What do you do with challenging behaviours? So screaming, hitting, mm -hmm. et cetera. Oh, my word. Once more, is there any age coming through? Five, okay. five years old. Okay. Uh, with a little boy, um, I would first, as a psychologist say, is there opportunity for that boy to let off steam in other activities? So is there opportunity for, for him to invent, to vent his frustrations his, his difficulty. So is he playing a sport? Is he getting exercise? Is there some outdoor play? So I would focus on the venting of increased energy first and foremost. I would then make sure that it's not happening in the home amongst the adults and that the adults are not acting like teenagers. They actually are, are uh, self-regulating. I would then teach that boy um, three or four feeling words. So it can be as simple as mad, bad, glad, sad, and help him to identify those states. So, and you do that on an everyday basis. So did you notice that little boy sad or, or I'm feeling mad today and this is how it feels. I feel like a bit flushed in the cheeks. I feel um, tension in my, in my jaw or my shoulders. I'm feeling mad because of, and you help this child identify feeling states because a, a child who's just yelling and shouting like that is clearly expressing 
from different feeling states, but has not been able to recognize those feeling states. And then teach that child to self-regulate. So identify the feeling. Is it sadness? Is it madness? Is it angry? Is it frustration? But find easy feeling words. And then they identify that and then help them with some breathing techniques to, to be able to calm their own nervous system and, and then offer some kind of reward for a, whether it's a hug or a praise or an affirmation about him being able to calm himself down on by himself. And then you can role play that with him. And um, then obviously there's always room for pulling parental rank every now and then and just saying this is you know I've been through this with you it's unacceptable go to your room or go outside or go and scream into a pillow um, it's I'm, I'm not having this behavior directed at me so there is room for that and then there's also room to ignore <laughs> so there'll be times where you just have to ignore but I definitely um, teach that child how to calm their own nervous systems down through breath work and identifying and, and, and being able to name the feeling. Okay, um, excellent. Thank you. And I think this is a really nice question, actually, to um, fi finish, the, uh, finish the evening. It's something we all as parents wonder. What age do you find um, kids return to you after they get through those Horrible teenage Boisterous teenage. times, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, the brain science shows us that by the end of the 16th year, most boys are beginning to think of consequences and be able to have um, an active prefrontal cortex where they're able to think through um, their actions and set intentions. So from around the 16th year, setting intentions then in the 17th year towards the end and it just depends on on if you've got a little boy who doesn't have a growth spurt in the 17th year then this would be the 18th year as parents we need to start looking for activities that we can do with our boys alone so I started this in the 17th year and 18th year of my son's life where I, we identified what we could do together. So what I could do with my one son and what I could do. And it can be as simple as my youngest son loved food. So we explored um, restaurants and, and, and food recipes together. My other son just love deep conversations, philosophical conversations. So we'd look for things and we'd, and we'd spend time together looking for things where we could, where, that we could share in conversation. But it could be sport, it could be chess, it could be tennis, it could be walking the dog. It doesn't matter what it is. You find something that you can do with your son on your own, especially as moms, because boys tend to do you know, fly off into their own independence and forget the, 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 the necessity for a good relationship with mom. So look for those activities that you can do together um, and start putting them in place. And I definitely find around the 17th, 18th year, there is this opportunity for you and your, and your boy to find activity, but you will never be what you were when he was eight, nine, and 10. It will never be that again. There will never be those times of, you know, long lingering cuddles and, and um, uh, him wanting to spend lengthy periods of time together. But there will be opportunities to be together in a, as, as adults in a good, solid relationship. Oh, that, that is good to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time tonight, Megan. Um, I can highly recommend to everyone to get this book. It's just so full of practical advice. Like it's just mm -hmm. lots of really interesting information um, about how to, you know, like you said, recognize yourself and how you parent um, and how to deal with your teenagers' behaviours, discipline, all everything. So it's really fantastic. So um, Megan does has courses, um, advice, a great um, – uh, you can access her articles on there that she writes um, through there as well. So um, head to Megan's website if you'd like to find out more. Great. Thank you so much for that.